shall we say, Second Chronicles chapter 29, and we were reading about the man Hezekiah. Probably stop at verse 10. I'm probably just going to um, just read a couple of verses, just read them and then open it up with one verse or two at a time rather than I'm hoping to get to the end of this chapter and not be all night, if you know what I mean. So it took us a bit of time just to get to the, uh, the 10. So again, um, as we know Hezekiah is a very godly man, a, go a godly king. He's come off the back of his father, was a very ungodly man and, uh, and for 16 years and he was, I mean, the whole nation became apostate of Judah and, shall we say, the, the, the land of Judah. The nation, don't forget, the, 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 the northern kingdom, that was when Jude, the Israel was split into two kingdoms. The ten tribes of the north, and then you had the tribe of Judah in the south. And then um, the ungodly ones were always probably more northerly, but there was a few ungodly ones in the land of Judah as well. So now he's come off the back of a terrible father who brought apostasy not only just to the whole land, and uh, even to the point he shut up the kingdom, he, he shut the, the house of God was closed and they barred anybody from going in and altars and all the high places were all over the place. And um, so now his son has come on, he's starting to tidy the place up, he's starting to put the house of the Lord together and re-establish the worship of God as it should be. And so then he says in verse 10, It was in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Now we're going to start from verse 11. And we'll just unpack it as we go. Now he's encouraging the Levites and the priesthood. He says, Now, my sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that you may minister to him with and burn incense. And so here he's encouraging the Levites. He says, You have been chosen, and the priesthood, you have been chosen especially for God, for this task of putting the house of God in order. And I've got down there just three things that really just kind of stuck out to me and then um, that we can see straight away they were not to be negligent not what negligent is to be careless or not being responsible all the things I was at school foolish or to be compromised and it says there so there were to be men who were to be men of integrity not to be negligent it's not easy to be negligent I think I said this morning you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do uh, but it's so easy to put off doing the right thing or to be negligent or say, I'll catch you later. And, you know that? Is it just me sometimes? I need to deal with something. I'll deal with that tomorrow. Trouble this tomorrow never comes. We just keep putting it off. Especially if it's something awkward or if it's something I don't want to do. Um, I used to be that when I was in business and maybe it'd be a particular job, but I knew this job was going to be a nightmare. So I kept putting it in the back of the queue to the point the lady eventually got frustrated with me because I just didn't want to do it. I knew it was going to be one of those jobs, that, you know, so. And then eventually you have to, shall we say, do it. So it's one of those things, it's easy to be negligent, put off what needs to be done. And, um, and now he is just now encouraging, don't be negligent or careless or compromised or foolish. Take responsibility. And I've got down here, you know, all of us um, are called to the priesthood of believers today. Now, this was a word just to the priests and to the Levites. Now we come into the New Testament and Peter again encourages us to say, we are all Levitical, we are all a royal priesthood. All of us now. The door has been opened wide to all of us. God now has included all of us. It wasn't just the chosen few. God now has opened up the door to all of us. And I read these scriptures from for you this evening as well. Um, and we'll just jump up to Peter and I'll just read a couple of scriptures just to encourage us tonight. When you know how precious we are, what God has done for us, it is astounding. And uh, we have to keep pinching ourselves to say, is he actually, does he mean me? So it's always sometimes, say, well, I understand it might be him, but sometimes we fail to understand, no, it's you. It's you. And we have to keep telling ourselves that we're all called and we have a special relationship with the Lord and all of us are precious, not just a few, but all of us who have taken hold of them, repent of our sins and endorse the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And if nobody's done that here tonight, you might have an invitation at the end that you can engage God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and come to that place of repenting of your sins and being forgiven and enter into a loving relationship with the loving God. It's the greatest thing I've ever done, and I've been doing that it's going back now quite a few years. Um, quite a few years ago. Hallelujah. I've never regretted it. It just says this in verse chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action and be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace given to you when Yeshua the Messiah is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. God has asked us to be holy. 
Now God's never asked us something that's not important that it would be impossible for us to do. God has asked us to be holy because he is holy and God has given us of his spirit now so there's no reason why we should not be the holy people of God that God has called us to be. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are holy not because of anything of ourselves, but because of everything to do with him. He is the holy one. I've been crafted into him. So therefore my holiness is not in myself. It's in him. He is the one that we've been grafted into. Hallelujah. So when God looks at us, he sees his son. It's amazing, isn't it? Thank God. Sometimes I get myself afraid when I stand in front of the mirror, usually the first thing in the morning. <laughs> Glory to God. But God sees his son. That's why he loves us immensely and why we're so precious to him, because we're in his son. Glory to God. It's all to do with the son. And just a wee bit then, in chapter 2, verse 9, it says that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. And we could probably call them the little foxes that war against our soul. Hallelujah. But we are a royal priesthood. Glory to God. See, when you start to see yourself as God sees you, it will lift you up. Glory to God. We won't be living our lives just crawling along uh, as, as nobodies. I am somebody in Messiah Christ Jesus. Glory to God. I'm a, not a nobody. I am a somebody. I have an identity. My identity is in Christ Jesus. Once I was a pathetic idiot. A, 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 an idiot. Pathetic. That's who I once was. I'm not, that, I'm not that anymore. I am a son of the living God now in his son Christ Jesus. He has adopted me. I can call him Father by the Spirit he's given to me. I say, Abba, Father, because he has given me now of his Spirit. He's transformed me. I am a new creation. That old man is gone. Glory to God. I am a new man now in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That was, that was <laughs> exciting, isn't it, when you actually realise who you are? We need to realise who we are. Glory to God. The enemy will just keep rubbishing us. It just rubbishes all the time. It's all we do. We, we, it's all we do is struggle with because we're always struggling with our own identity. But we should not be struggling in our identity. We should be victorious in His identity. It's all about Him. Hallelujah. He's the one that does it. Glory to God. We just need to submit to that. So go down here, as He says to the, the these Levites. He says, "Now He says, God is sure to stand before Him to serve Him." That you should minister to him with incense. And I've got down there. Are you standing before him today? Are you standing before him? Are you, are you standing before the Lord this day? <coughs> Glory to God. Are you standing? Are you serving him? Ask the question. Are you actually, ask yourself, I, I, am I serving the Lord? Now that doesn't mean you say, we've all got different roles. And I don't want to be a killjoy. Listen, I think somebody says, we're not. Look, see, I understand the television can be a, a comfort, especially if you're lonely and you're sitting in the house. You know, I'm not saying don't watch the telly. I personally don't watch the telly. But you know what I mean? I know it can be a comfort for people who are lonely. And there's a lot of good programs, nature programs, different things, harmless things. There's a lot of rubbish on it. And I would encourage you not to watch rubbish because it's going into your eye gate and into your ear gate, your ear gate and it's having an effect upon you. What gets, it's, it's sown bad stuff into you. Therefore, be careful what you're watching. As the job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes, I will not look at a woman lustily. It's very difficult to watch a television and not see a lot of flesh. Even in programmes now that are meant to be built as a 12, I'm going to tell you this, a 12 is now worse than 18. Yes. It, it just seems as if everything's went to, oh, we, we bring back many White House lot. You know, we, maybe we are, we're living in an age now, everything's just, I mean, even these pop videos, that, you know, I mean, they're just soft pornography, actually. That's, I mean, it is. It's like, you know, you, and young kids, nine and ten, are watching all of these pop stars. There's nothing left to the imagination. Neither are the lyrics. So we need to be very careful with that. Hallelujah. That's just a bit of there at home. So glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me get back to my place. So are we, ser are we serving him? And are, are you actually, literally, are you, do you feel as if you're serving the Lord? Or are you serving yourself? Are you ministering to him in worship? That was their job, was to burn the worship and to offer up the sacrifices. Are you, are you ministering to God in worship? We've all called to be worshippers. All of us are called to just, we are, we are that place that we can lift up in, in the worship and we can set that. It's like incense rising into the throne of the Lord. Do you know that tonight when we were worshipping the Lord, it's received by him. Hallelujah. 
Glory to God. It's not just aimlessly singing in here, it's bouncing off the ceiling if it's got good insulation or not. Actually, God receives that worship when it comes from the heart. And it pleases God. It pleases Him. Or else, it's a pointless business, what are we doing it for? If it means nothing. It means a lot to the Lord, but it's actually very meaningful for us as well. Glory to God. We focus upon Him, the one that we are worshipping. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I thank God that I'm not singing for any other bunch of clowns, whatever they might be. I think they are. Do you remember the days of being at the concerts and all that? <laughs> Shouting and bawling like some idiot, you know, to some rocks group. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So now it says here, now, it's, now he goes on here, it says, now, it, now it, it says here that you should minister before him. It says, you stand before him, my sons, be, do not be negligent in this business. And then we get all these Levites that are named and they stand up. And it says then in verse 15, it says, and they gathered their brethren, and, and they gathered their brethren, sanctified themselves, and went according to the commandment of the king and the words of the Lord to, to cleanse the house of the Lord. Let me read a couple of verses now, I'll backtrack here. Then the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the debris that had been found, that had been found in the temple of the Lord to the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it to the brook of the kindred, or your version might say the kindred valley, where the valley was. Then they began to sanctify in the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month they came to the vestibule of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and on the sixteenth day of the first month they finished. Then he went into the king Hezekiah and said to him, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings with all of his articles, the table, the showbread, and with all of its articles. Moreover, all the articles which the king Ahaz in his reign had cast aside in his transgression, we have prepared and sanctified. And there they are before the altar of the Lord. Glory to God. They put the house, the house of God was put in order because it was in a terrible state, because it was defiled by an ungodly king and all the or maybe ungodly priests as well they were serving in here. So we can see here the sanctified brethren came together in response to the king by the word of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Glory to God. The sanctified brethren, which was the Levites and the priesthood. And that's who we are as well, brethren. We are that royal priesthood. So often we can always think it's somebody else's responsibility. Not all of us have got a responsibility because we're all part of the priesthood who sanctified themselves and that means you make yourself holy, you set yourself apart unto the work unto the Lord. And I want to encourage all of us that all of us are in that place. So you say it's somebody else's job, not your job, it's my job, all of our job to sanctify ourselves. We're all called to be holy, not just the, the chosen frozen or the chosen few that stands up here. All of us, wherever we're part we are in church, we're all called to live a holy life and to live and to live a sanctified life before the living God. And you know, if you go to Exodus 32, that's when the Levites were chosen. That was one of the 12 sons, if you like, of Jacob. And uh, they were chosen member that came off the back of Exodus 32 when they put out the golden calf. Moses was talking about and getting the law. Just near enough on the eve when they would return him with the law and then the people lost faith in Moses. What's that up to this man? And then they built a golden calf and then everybody went wild and they all started dancing around and they became, and they, you know, they began to defile themselves before the worship of this calf. And then Moses comes down, he, he, he tears them to shreds, breaks the commandments, and he says, all those who are for God, come and stand with me. And the tribe of Levi gathered around Moses and they stood over the line. Obviously that was a line in the sand. And that's when the Levites then were chosen. God set them apart as they were the ones who were going to be serving now before the Lord. Their job was now, they would be standing before the people and the Lord as they could, as they could took that stand. And so we hear the saying now, they're sanctified now, and they're standing there, they were the chosen ones. And it says, then they took all the rubbish, all the rubbish to the Kindred Valley. And so then they get into the house of God, they bring out all the rubbish. That's a good time for us to, usually it's a, usually a spring time, it's a good time for us to do that, isn't it? Give a, I mean, I don't know where we're going to get some rubbish from, there's always big black bags full of stuff, I don't know where she accumulates it from. <laughs> <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in there, but it's in your wardrobe and there's another big bag of clothes or something. Where did these clothes come from, you know? And um, I just tend to hang on to all my old rubbish clothes, don't I? And just keep them in there for a rainy day. There'll be stuff in there for years and years and years. 
But it is a time, you know, when it's amazing how rubbish accumulates. I just get, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly getting my garages. Where, how does this place just end up full of trash? I ever go up to the loft go, where does all this stuff come from? It's one of those videos of the thing. You just seem to put it on the loft. You know what? Us guys are terrible for that. We don't throw anything away. So I might need that, so I'll stick it away for a rainy day. And then before you know it, it's just junk. It just lies in there collecting, you know, and, and it's, it's amazing to collect junk, you know, and rubbish. And here we see this in the there's, there's all this rubbish now has been accumulated in the house of God because it's been neglected. Who knows what it was putting in there? And their job was to cleanse it. So they take all the rubbish to the Kindred Valley. Now, for any of us who've been in Israel, and it's not the Kindred Valley is just between the, the between the city, just in the just between the city and the Mount of Olives. It's that valley. I love walking through that valley, by the way, and just cutting down and going up to the to the Mount of Olives. And many of us have probably done it often and often. But it's that valley, it's that, that big ravine that comes from the city. You come down into the valley, and then you go up. Jesus would have done that many times, especially when he was going to the Garden of Gethsemane. Some people believe that could have been on that outskirts of, the, of that valley as well. And so that was a place that they would take the debris. That was the rubbish dump. Now we've got rubbish dumps here. You take your rubbish and you would take it at a particular place that would designate it to actually to deal with the rubbish. And that was a place and that was a place where they were to take all that rubbish and they would burn it there. And they would do away with it there. Hallelujah. And it was a designated place and it was called... Um, in the Kidron Valley. We see that with jo uh, Josiah as well, one of the kings, when he was taking the idols away that were not, they, all the idols that were they, they found in the temple, they took them and they took them to the Kidron Valley and that's when they burned them and they scattered their ashes. There were some people down there that met their deaths as well. It was a dark place. Asa as well took something into that valley as well and burnt an idol as well. And some people believe in, I think it's Josephus, the great Jewish historian believes that when, in Job 3, 14, it talks about when God's going to bring all the people and take them to the Valley of Decision in Job 3, 14. Some people believe that will be the Kindred Valley where God's going to actually hold them accountable. But that's um, Josephus that suggested that. But it could be a good call. Who knows? But it's an important place. It's a place where you take the rubbish to get rid of the rubbish. Glory to God. We take our rubbish and we take it to the cross. Amen. That's a good place where you take it. We take it, we take it to the cross and we leave it at the cross and let God deal with it. Hallelujah. We bring it, we pay it, we put it under the blood and we ask God to deal with it. We need to get rid of the rubbish, guys. And listen, we'll all get rubbish. Amen. Not get two hands up here. Praise God. And we're constantly having to deal with the Lord because he's his finger on it, and this is a case of now he's cleansing the temple, but they have to <coughs> cleanse themselves first. Cleanse themselves first before they then begin and cleanse the temple. And before we can be effective for God, we need to deal with ourselves. Amen. Amen. Deal with yourself. Glory to God. And then we'll be able to be more effective in the house of the Lord. And then we're going to deal with the house of the Lord. So we can see this here as well. In verse 4, it said there very, my fourth point on verse 4. It says, then the priest went into, it says, on the first day, then the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. They brought out, as we know, all that rubbish was brought out and they took it away there. They began to sanctify on the first day of the first month. Amen. So they started on the first day of the first month. And for the first eight days, I will leave it be the outer court. They would have cleansed the outer court. And then it says, when they came to the vestibule, or, or the, the, that would be the inner court. Not the Holy of Holies as such, that would be the inner court. The only the priesthood would be allowed into the inner court. And took them another eight days to cleanse that. That would have been 16 days in total that it took them to walk to cleanse the temple. But it says on the first day of the first month, the work began. Glory to God. 14 days, if you like, before Passover. The first day of the first month. Because don't forget, Passover was the 14th day of the first month. That was the first month for Israel. So that was the first day of the first of that first month, and there was 14 days till Passover. Let me just fast forward up a little bit here to John chapter 2. And we read here about an occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ goes into what cleanse the temple. Hallelujah. In John's Gospel, chapter 2, we read this, verse 13. Jesus cleanses the temple. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and ducks, and money changers, and they were all doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep, the oxen, and he poured out the changers, the changers of money and overturned their tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. 
Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. In another place it says, a den of robbers. He was appalled of what was going on in the very temple of the living God. And he turned everything upside down. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. I pray that the zeal for the house of God will actually eat a lot more people up as the days that we move in just now. A few more Hezekiahs are going to come and going to look at the state of the church. Jesus did this at the very beginning of his ministry. He went into the temple of the Lord and he turns things upside down. I wonder what he would do to his church today if he came into this um, environment now today. I wonder, I wonder what he would do to his church today if he did it back then. The things that are going on in the church. But we see here again that it says it was near Passover. Jesus now goes in. He's in Jerusalem obviously for Passover. It's not quite Passover. Jesus goes into the temple and he now turns the place upside down. Glory to God. This is the Holy One himself comes into it and he says, zeal for his father's house had consumed him. How dare you? Do you know something, guys? We need to get a bit more serious about the house of God. Does it disturb you? I said that when I was in Edinburgh. Does it disturb us, the state of the church? Does it disturb us? Have we just so become so accustomed to it? Does, it? does it bother you when we see the wickedness that's in the church, when we see the idolatry, when we see the, the flesh, when we see the, the, the sin? Sin to a degree that we would never have imagined we could see in the, the, in the church. And think, I think sometimes we just become accustomed to it and say, well, you know, and are, are we making excuses for it? I believe God is stirring up a people just now. We'll be zealous for the Father's house. Hallelujah. And I'm not just talking about this house. I'm talking about the bigger picture is the house, the, the church and the nation of God. We need to be zealous for the Father's house. Hallelujah. I believe God has been a zeal within me. That's what, you know, in Edinburgh was a wee mini explosion of that. But it saddens me and I get in it because people have never got a bad opinion about God because they look at his church. We are we should be a reflection of who he is. And when they see us, they laugh at us, they mock at us, and they've got a bad attitude against God. That's why I said in Edinburgh, we are to blame. The church is at fault for the state of the nation. Oh so well, it's just that's just to be no no no. We have failed. We have failed. We have failed. We dropped the baton. We allowed stuff to creep in. The rock began. And people left in their droves, and it's a judgment against God, and it was a judgment of God against us. And I'm talking, and we're part of that church, we're not saying, oh wait, but we're okay. No, we're part of that church. We need to get that zeal back again for the, for the Lord, hallelujah. Be zealous for the Lord, for the God that we serve. Glory to God for his honour. Jesus was zealous for the Father's honour. No, Jesus never came to glorify himself, he came to glorify his Father. He was filled with zeal for his Father. Oh, glory to God. May we get a bit of that zeal will rise up within us and we'll start to rise up now and we'll start to challenge. When we're out there in the street and somebody says something against the Lord, we will rise up. Watch your mouth, son. I remember being in Stirling, Dale with with us. That was one of those marches. We did the Stirling march. There's a couple of wee boys. There's a boy up there. He was giving it, he was giving it all. Big likes, Grant, you know him. And he was, he was, he was evangelising in the square. And we were there, Jamie was there as well. We were just standing there, just encouraging him. And there was a couple of young boys that was preaching with Jesus, the Son of God. And we went, well, who knows, maybe, who says he's Son of God? Maybe he's a, maybe he's, maybe he's a woman. And they start all that, you know, it just shows how that transgenderism is all over the place. Well, who says, I went, shut your mouth, son, wash your mouth. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he tried to get a wee bit more funnier with him again. I said, son, I tell you right now, shut your mouth. <laughs> We're dealing with the Son of God. And then we back in a moment, and they moved on again. And I wasn't going to let that be, and I wasn't going to let that go unchecked. Hallelujah. We need to be, the need to rise up and let people know a bit of passion, rather than just, well, just keep your mouth shut. They're not allowed to say anything in case we offend anybody. We need to start rising up and speaking out. Yes. Glory to God. Let them see what's you. May get you any trouble? Well, praise God, let all the disciples in trouble. Trouble will come to you when you start speaking out for the Lord. Glory to God. I'm going to be in the interview Tuesday night. I think there's trouble coming to me at nine o'clock with Richard Lucas and there's this kind of live stream and he's wanting to interview me. And it, it, maybe he'll ask me some questions and I'll maybe say some things and it's maybe going to be, uh, who knows? It's, remember Dr. James McConnell from Ireland, Belfast Church? And, uh, and he was preaching and he kind of seemed to denounce Islam. So it was a false faith. And somebody got a hold of that, that recording, and he was getting dragged into court. All fell through because they'd been James McConnell, he's no longer with us, he's, he's up there in the realms of heaven, he's just now Dr. James McConnell. 
Um, but he was an old man by this time, he was battling cancer, plus he's very, very popular. So it wasn't a fight that they would probably want to drag him into court because it probably wouldn't have been there. So, you know, sometimes it's like we're scared to say something. Listen, we should never be scared to speak the truth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me get back to my place here now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I just seem to get a wee bit sidetracked here, get a bit excited in the moment. Um, and then they began to walk. It took them. Jesus was full of zeal for the Father. But it's interesting he came to cleanse the temple just before Passover. Glory to God. Then we see here it says it took there. It says then it took 14 days. It, it, it was 16 days, 8 days in outer court and 8 days in the inner court. And that's why I tell you this, they were cleansing it completely. This wasn't up or down here. This was a deep clean. This is not a surface wipe. Linda always accuses me of that. I was like, what the heck takes you so long? You're not just in the house. You don't clean it properly. I get annoyed. I get annoyed with that because I think I do, but she's like, you know, she's in it every week, nook and cranny. But I want you to tell you this, that place had to be cleansed to the slightest little speck it was in the house of God. This was, this, this was, this was, this was, this was on your hands and knees stuff. That temple of God was being cleansed. It's like with the Jews that when they're leading up to Passover, they, they, they go through the house and make sure there's no any unleavened bread in the house and they can, they go through this ritual, which is a, a form of getting rid of sin in your life sort of thing, but it's like they go through the house and they, and they have to look for any little trays down the side of the couches and all that. I mean, what they had, what they see these crumbs, they just appear, don't they? I mean, you ever try eating a biscuit and not have a crumb falling over the place? They just, it's amazing how they just crumbs get places, isn't it? Little crumbs. But everything had to be meticulously cleaned out. That temple was cleaned meticulously. Father said, because it had been defiled horrifically, glory to God. So it took them 16 days in total to clean the house of the Lord. Glory to God. The damage had been, but then the, the damage had been repaired. Glory to God. They had sanctified it and all the damage had been repaired. Glory to God. Glory to, after 16 days. 16 days. It says Ahaz ruled for 16 years. That's a day a year. One day a year, if you wanted to do the mass. <coughs> for, for the 16 years that this man Ahaz ruled and was a corrupt leader and an apostate leader and had defiled the nation and defiled the temple of God. And 16 days it took them to clean that. That's one day a year represented for that. So it's how you, the Lord works in these things. And in the end of it, it says, now it was good to go. Glory to God. The house had been cleansed, put in order. Hallelujah. I long for the days that this nation, also the church in this land, can get its act together. And we can start to repair the damage and get rid of the apostasy and the filth and the rubbish that's been put into the church. Glory to God. And I believe that and I believe we're going to see a lot more of that. We're going to see God God is God is concerned for his house in the land of Scotland. Hallelujah. God is concerned for Scotland and he's concerned for his church in Scotland. And it seems as if God has stood back. I mean, for sixteen years God allowed this man to what to to to, to defile the temple. And God seemed to allow that for 16 years. Never checked him. 16 years. Defilement, even to the point where they were putting up idols all over, even in the temple of God. And then he shut the doors, and yet it seemed as if God was silent. God is never silent. Sometimes, you know, it's just because God stands back as if, as if God is not concerned, or God's not working behind the scenes. God is concerned for this nation. I've said it time and time again. God's getting unfinished business for Scotland. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's a cleansing fire, I believe, that's going to come to this church first and foremost. Glory to God. God's going to put his house in order. I'm not talking about the big, the, you know, but that'll be a remnant, but glory to God. God is preparing a remnant people, and he's looking for a people who are going to be zealous for him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We'll get that as we just push on to the next point here. Then they come to the, the king, and his, everything now is in order. Everything is restored. And the word comes to the king, it's good to go. And we see here that in, in verse 20, it says, Then King Hezekiah rose early and gathered all the rulers of the city, and they went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought the bulls and seven rams and seven lambs, seven male goats for a sin offering in the kingdom and the sanctuary, and for Judah. And they commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them up on the altar of the Lord. 
So they killed the bulls and the priests sprinkled the blood onto the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood onto the altar. And they also killed the rams and sprinkled the blood onto the altar. Hallelujah. Now the, the sacrifice has been offered up unto God. The blood has been spilled onto the altar. Hallelujah. Covering their sins. The priests killed them and they presented their blood unto the altar as a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for all Israel. Very interesting, I don't know if you picked that up there. I mean, Hezekiah made the command, they weren't just going to make that offering just for the tribe of Judah, which was two nations now, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. He ordered, no, that that sacrifice was for all Israel. It was for all the nation. He never distanced himself from the northern kingdom. He embraced them as well and says, that sacrifice now is going to be for all the kingdom. Hallelujah. That's why when I believe when we went to Edinburgh, the prayer was for all of Scotland. Mm-hmm. Glory to God. We had to cover all the nation. We covered all the nation. It wasn't just part of the nation or this week group over here. I felt it had to be national repentance. And here this Hezekiah and everything been brought together. He could have just said, now they were a nation within themselves. But he made the command and says, no, this is, this sacrifice is for all the nation, for the, for the northern tribes as well. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful he's included them? And they were many times that enemies fighting against one another. Bless your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Hallelujah. And he wanted to very much um, make sure that they were included in that sacrifice now that has been offered up. For 16 long years there was no sacrifice that had been offered up before the Lord or they were, they, were, they were hindered by the sin of the nation. Now everything's been put in order. Hallelujah, been put in order, cleansed, the temple's cleansed, the people have cleansed themselves, the temple has been cleansed, and now the sacrifices have been offered up again unto the, the mighty God of heaven because of this man Hezekiah who became a catalyst to turn the nation or to turn the tribes back again unto the Lord. So we can see that now it says, then it says here, then he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with symbols and stringed instruments, hearts, according to the commandment of David and the word of God, and the God, the king seer, and Nathan the prophet. For this was the commandment of the Lord for his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with their trumpets. Hallelujah. Hezekiah commanded them to offer up burnt offerings on the altar. And when the burnt offerings began, the song of the Lord also began with trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped the singers, worshipped the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offerings were finished. Glory to God. And when he had finished off from the king and all those who were present with him bowed down and he worshipped. Moreover, King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and that As- Asaph, the seer. So that they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and they worshipped. Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now that you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord, come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings unto the house of the Lord. So the assembly brought in the sacrifices and thank offerings, and many, as many as were willing, of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. Again, here, as many of us willing, a willing heart brought their burnt offerings. I mean, God always responds to a willing heart. If you do anything and you're forced to do, it's not an offering. That's why I refuse to bulldoze anybody for money in that basket. I don't care for your money. If you don't want to give money there willingly, then sack it, hang on to it. It has to be done willingly. And that's not just if you're given finances, but that has to be often up your worship unto the Lord as well. God responds well to willing hearts. See if you're kind of grumbling and mumbling about something. You know, I mean, it used to be with my kids, you're trying to get them to do something, and it's like moaning and groaning, and I'm just like, shh, get, I'll do it myself. No, why? Because I hate moaning, I hate groaning. <laughs> I mean, no wonder, what is the, what is the prophet who says, you know, well, a, a, a nagging wife that gets dripping tan, but I am not a nagging wife, I just mentioned that once in the very There's no fish. But you know something, see, you're just constantly going, and I, I did, and I just despair, and sometimes I do that in the church as well, because there's maybe I need nobody's what I do, I just say, I'll do it myself. See, if I have to moan and moan and moan for somebody to do something, and it's not done by a willing heart, God responds to a willing heart, see, when somebody gets a willing heart, says, right, hey, I'm going to do this. Praise God, it's music to my ears. But see, if you're having to moan, I can moan it with somebody to get somebody to do something. Sack it, I'd rather do it myself. And that's the way it is with the Lord as well. It has to come willingly. See, when somebody does something willingly for you, it's not such a blessing. You've never even asked them, but they just bless you with something. Never ask them. 
In fact, not such a blessing when somebody just thought about you to do something and they, and, 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 and they offer up themselves. That's the kind of people we should be, I want to tell you this, especially before the Lord. And so all of this has been done, been offered up unto the Lord, and there's great joy and excitement, a willing heart. And then verse 32 again, just get that wee willing heart through me there. And then the number of the bottom offerings which the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All of these were of a burnt offering to the Lord. The consecrated things were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few, so that they could not skin all the burnt offerings. Therefore their brethren, the Levites, helped them until the work was ended, until the other priests had sanctified themselves. So some of the priests were a little bit slow getting sanctified. For the Levites were more diligent in sanctifying themselves than the priests. Isn't that interesting? The Levites were more diligent than some of the priests in sanctifying themselves. You're always going to get that in any group of people. You've got people who are more serious than others. Hallelujah. And it says here, the Levites were more diligent in sanctifying themselves than the priests. Also, the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat, the peace offerings, and with the drink offerings, every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. Glory to God. I pray that God will put his house in order. Then it says in verse 36, Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced that God had prepared the people since the events took place so suddenly. Hezekiah now is rejoicing now. Hallelujah. Everything had happened so quickly. Glory to God. The house had been put in order. The, the sacrifices now have been offered up before God. Incense, the burnt offerings. The, the blood has been spilled upon the altar, covering their, their sin. And, and it says everybody was bringing all their offerings before God. The music played, hallelujah. By the way, the music is being prepared here as well. And we're going to, hopefully, I think it's going to be Easter. There's going to be a live um, group here then bringing worship to us in that Easter Sunday morning. But two things I wanted to flag up just as we come to a close now. I wanted to finish with this. There were some more serious than others. Can I encourage you? Look, guys, zeal just doesn't happen. Just doesn't. It's not, there's not a pill. You can take a zeal pill. 